is here. Matthew 4, verse 1. We just uh, shared this verse about the wilderness and temptation. But it was back in the 1980s, a very significant event happened in my life. It was the advent of the Nintendo Entertainment System. How many remember this amazing decade when now you didn't have to go to the arcade, but the system was in your house? So I was homeschooled during elementary school. So uh, one Christmas, that magical Christmas, I believe it was 1986, I got that Nintendo in my house with Duck Cunt and Super Mario on the same cartridge. If you remember this, it was a legendary day with our giant TV that weighed about 250 pounds in our front of our living room. But again, like any household, there was moderation with this. We didn't have all the liberty we wanted to play it. So part of the rules were, as a homeschool family, I had to finish all my work, and maybe in the afternoon I would get a little bit of time to play. Well, unfortunately, shortly after that, my mother was in a serious car accident. So as she was hit from the behind, you know, just had a real severe whiplash response, and my dad took some time off of work. But shortly after that, her recovery was really a, a long period of time. So in the morning, she'd just wake up in this chronic pain. So the normal routine would be is we'd wake up, have breakfast. I'd pull out my, my work, do my math page, do my vocabulary page, bring it to my mom, and then she would test it and correct it. Well, she was in so much pain, I brought her my math page, and she looked at it and just made sure that I filled in the answers and said, okay, well, you know, I, great job, Brandon. You did your math for the day. That was kind of the, what took place. Well, after I showed my work to my mom, this idea came in my mind. I thought, she didn't check the answers. Let me test this again. So I went back. Normally, I'd be done with my work, and I filled in a bunch of bogus answers and brought it back to my mom. She said, you did a second page. You know, this was like this victorious moment in our household, you know, above and beyond in school. She's like, I'm so proud of you. You've earned extra game time. And I take it back, and I'm like, this is the magic key that I've looked for. Next day comes three math pages. The next day, four math pages. I finish my entire math book in three weeks. And I am just like the star child at home. You know, Brandon's excelling in his work, and I'm playing games as much as I want at this point. And then one morning, my mom woke up. I said, Brandon, I'm so proud of you. I'm feeling better. Now's the time to go back and recheck all of your work. <laughs> and you know, you're just like in your room, and you're waiting to just for that voice to come. I'm waiting, and I'm waiting, and I start to hear whimpering and crying from the other room. And I come in, and my mom's like, are you okay? I have all these crazy, you know, answers that are wrong. I mean, are you not understanding the math questions? And, you know, my mom's having this crisis because she thinks I have a learning disability <laughs> at this point. And I have to say, I filled in the wrong answers on purpose and they were bad it was like I was writing letters in you know like algebraic equations and you know third grade it was just ridiculous things and there's something in our adolescence where we think if we're, our work is not going to get checked that we can get by with cutting corners that if we're going to have a test if it's really not going to be evaluated we think we can get by by shaving off the edges or making it look like we've done the work that we were supposed to do. And as much as we like to think it's really subject to our adolescence, it happens in our adulthood as well. One famous sociologist named Dan Ariely, it's a great documentary. I don't know if it's available anymore on Netflix called Dishonest. And uh, in this documentary, they had this massive test for 40,000 people. They went to various locations, and it was very simple. They gave people a math page with 20 simple math questions on it and said, for every question you solve, you'll earn $1, the potential to earn $20. So they would sit everybody down. They would give them five minutes, and they said, this is an honesty test. After you fill it out, we'll then take your paper and you put it into a shredder, and we'll trust you to know how many questions you answered. So people would sit down. They purposely only gave them five minutes, so there was no way they could finish the questions in the allotted time. They would sit down. The five-minute buzzer would go off. People would then take their paper and put it into the shredder. Many reported nearly 70% that they solved six questions correctly, so they would get $6. However, of those 70%, often they only solved four problems. 
The reason they knew this was is the shredder was a reverse shredder and actually never shredded the document that they put it into. So they could test all these different tests, and they found that a majority of us, when we feel that we're not going to be held accountable, will shave corners and cut corners. 70%. They said there was about 1 out of 10 that actually didn't cheat during these tests. See, when we know that there's really no accountability in place or someone's not watching over us, the, the scientist said this. It says, we have this ten tendency to tweak the data and convince ourselves that we're simply helping the outcome. We convince ourselves that by tweaking the data, we're helping the outcome. And many of us, as we go through wilderness seasons in our life, are really good at putting on this face, this outcome, like everything's okay. But let me just let you into a little insight biblically. The Lord knows everything. Jeremiah 17.10, brutal verse. The Lord, I, the Lord, test the mind and search the heart to give all according to their ways, according to the fruit of their doings. See, God can't be convinced no matter how eloquent you sound. He knows the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. He knows when we're trying to put on a nice Christian face on the outside, but it's all hell breaking loose on the inside. He knows the condition and the testing, and we talked about this two weeks ago, where God uses the wilderness to prune us, to refine us, and to discipline us. And it's in this place of the wilderness, this discipline happens as we find that this mirrors really the wilderness of Israel. This discipline is used to train us. Many of us have this adverse response to discipline where we think of our earthly fathers that maybe disciplined us in an inappropriate way. We have to remember we have a perfect father in heaven with perfect character. It says in Matthew 6, our father in heaven, holy is his name. His character is perfect, and he knows how to train and discipline us appropriately. And the spirit, after Jesus' baptism, inauguration of his kingdom comes. He's affirmed by the Father in heaven. The spirit leads him into the wilderness. And what we'll find is this. Upon these amazing moments when you receive Jesus and your life is transformed or you had those warm, fuzzy feelings at an altar call or a worship service, there's always a wilderness to follow. And it's not God's punishment on you. It's his provision for your growth. See, the wilderness is not something that we have to resist or fight or pray out. It's necessary for our growth, pruning, and sanctification. Because guess what? He's trying to make you conform into the image of Jesus. And transformation is a difficult process. You ever take like a pottery class? Back in junior high or high school or college? See, a pottery class is one of the most fun, exciting classes, but it is insanely messy. You ever take one of those? I remember one day, I took pottery class, we're spinning the wheel. It's amazing, I'm making this vase, and you think you're incredible at spinning these things. It's messy. I wore white khaki pants that day. And I walk up, and there's mud all over my pants. It's a messy process, this process of transformation that God uses. And we have to often reference the language that is used. Again, it was an agrarian society, an agricultural society. When you ever plant something, it takes a long time for fruit to produce. You ever plant like a fruit tree? You plant that tree, spring comes, there's nothing for like three years. See, it takes a long time for the roots to settle. And see, God wants lasting fruit, not temporal fruit in your life. And the way he does this, again, Jeremiah's verse, he tests the mind, he tests the heart, he shapes the mind, and he shapes the heart so that you have fruit that remains, fruit that lasts. We don't want to be standing before him like those, that brutal parable in Matthew 7, where they say, I've done miracles in your name, I've prophesied. God says, I never knew you. That's a real reality we have to face. And he does the wilderness as a grace, as a provision to us. And the Spirit leads Jesus into the wilderness, verse 2. And it says this, he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. 
Now, we think that, you know, obviously he's going to be hungry after these 40 days of fasting. Now, there's lots of different legends and beliefs. The reality is this. Jesus drank water on this fast. This is not a Moses fast where he's on the mountain with no food, no water. The reason why Matthew says this is because Jesus is physically hungry afterwards. Verse 3. And then the tempter came to him. Very important verse here. Isn't it interesting that the enemy comes when Jesus is hungry? You ever notice that? See, the enemy knows when you're fatigued, tired, and hungry. The enemy knows when you're famished and your soul feels empty. Because as the Lord uses the wilderness to discipline us, the enemy brings temptation to disqualify us. See, the wilderness is this playground. And again, when you watch this, it says the Spirit led Jesus to the wilderness to be tempted. And, and many of us respond. And we're like, what about James when it says God tempts no one? See, what Matthew does so brilliantly is he intertwines this word temptation and testing. It's the same word in the New Testament. And see, what God does is he brings the wilderness in our life to test us, to refine us, to improve us. But the enemy brings temptation to disqualify us. And he brings this level of enticement. And you'll notice here in a few minutes, he's after Jesus' identity. That's what the main disqualification piece is. Now, when you read this text, you might be confused because there's like a thousand different names that are used for the devil in this particular verse. Now, what happened in the monastic society about the you know, desert father, father seasons, the 1100s, 1200s, is they took this verse so literally, they believed that part of the discipleship process was to go and fight the devil in the wilderness for 40 days. They literally took this to heart, and they would say, have you had your battle with the devil yet? That was the reality they took. This is not meant to be exactly lived out. Just want to give you some heads up on this text. However, there is a real enemy that Matthew's introducing us to. Here's what some scholars say. The figure of Satan as an individual spiritual enemy of God and his people is found only rarely in the Old Testament. We have 1 Chronicles, Job, and Zechariah. But by the first century, had developed under a variety of names. Get these. Belial, Belier, Mastema, Azizel, and most commonly Satan. Into a standard feature of Jewish belief and Christian church fully shared. So there's this character that goes by all these names. But here's the reality. His name boils down to one thing. The accuser. That's what he is. He's this accuser. And again, you'll hear lots of it. Again, I, I would really encourage you, don't go online and try to break down these theology classes on demonology and Satan. I'm just going to be straight. We take a lot of verses out of context when we're trying to create this demonology. It's really weird. We only have a couple different passages in the Old Testament. And a lot of those you would hear interpreted from Ezekiel, they are very specific prophecies talking about very specific kings in that time frame. So for us to try to weave this picture of what Satan looks like in a biblical perspective is really confusing and really hard to do. We have to take the verses that are plain and obvious to us. And Matthew 4 is one of those clear and obvious texts. So we have this tempter, we have this accuser that comes into this situation. And we have to understand, he's trying to thwart and stop the work of God's kingdom. That's his main plan. We, we really get this crazy thought and perspective of like, well, the enemy's after my life. It's a pretty narcissistic thought we have. We get really consumed with the warfare of the enemy against us personally. We have to understand you are a byproduct of God's kingdom. He's trying to overcome the kingdom of light. And you'll talk to friends that are in the world, and their life is bad. It's messed up. And they'll have demonic oppression on their life. That's real. But things will often go better in their lives because they're not a threat to the kingdom of darkness. They're participants in it. So when you say yes to Jesus and all hell breaks loose, yes, that happens. Because now you're a threat to the kingdom of darkness. And we have this theology that we do have where Paul often echoes, and Jesus does himself, that there's this authority that the devil has over the earthly terrain of the world that we believe was forfeited in the garden. 
So as he has this new authority over this, the kingdom of God is what Matthew uses. Luke uses the kingdom of heaven is now invading, and there's a war that breaks out. We have to understand that no war is won without warfare. We think that the life in the kingdom is free without suffering and difficulty. There is a real enemy that's out to steal, kill, and destroy. We have to be aware of this. And if you think your Christian life is going to be amazing and look like a page on Pinterest, it's just not going to happen. <laughs> See, it's, you don't live in this fantasy DIY show. Where all of a sudden, you know, you're with Chip and Joanna Gaines, the Holy Spirit's in your life, and your ugly house is being flipped inside out. It's like, it's amazing. It only took three days. Welcome to your whole life. You will be in constant renovation until Jesus comes back. Because he's preparing you for an eternal kingdom, not an earthly one. This eternal kingdom, as Mark said, not this temporal kingdom. And the enemy knows he can disqualify us with temptation. Now, temptation is not used a lot in the New Testament. I'll be honest with you. There's really only three major passages outside of this one. And what we have is Paul's the main one that writes about temptation. The other verse that he references is 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 9. It says this, But those who desire to be rich may fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. So Paul uses the temptation of riches. Jesus refers to it as the God we worship called mammon or worship God and money. Now, for a lot of us, when we read these verses about rich or wealthy, we often disqualify ourselves. We think, well, obviously it's not me because I don't live in a mansion. Obviously it's not me because I don't have seven cars in my garage. We have to understand the context of riches. See, right now, 20% of the richest people in the world consume 80% of the world's resources, according to the Global Rich List. 20% of the world's population consumes 80% of the world's resources. And when we hear stats like that, we're like, how dare they? How dare they be so selfish? Did you know you're in the top 20% of the world's richest if you make approximately more than $4 an hour? If you make more than $4 an hour on average, you're in the top 20% of the world's richest people. Now, what Paul's talking about, Timothy, is this richness that is opulent living. What we have to do is we don't demonize money. It's a tool for the kingdom of God, but it's how you utilize it. How will you utilize the resources that God has given to you? Because he's testing you. And a lot of us, i got to be honest, we bury our might like that man did with its parable of talents. And see, burying often sounds like, or in our opinion, oh, you know, I just kind of keep things to myself or... No, burying means you're not using it for God's kingdom. That's the context. Because the resources are the king's, not your own, and you're a steward of it. So many of us consume that talent and keep it to ourselves. See, God's looking at you right now, and you're saying, I wish my financial position would change. He's saying, you have the power to change it. Will you trust me with it? Will you be generous with what little I've given you? I mean, I was always convicted when Pastor Francis would share the story about him receiving $2 a week at this live-in community and him tithing off of it. That's the most painful story. You know he took that 20 cents with like all the joy and glory he could as he offered it to the Lord. And God says, can I trust you with what little you have so that I can give you much? See, we have to be careful not to fall into this temptation of riches because right now you walk on Instagram or Facebook or Twitter, you see this opulence. You see this picture of a perfect life that I got to be honest with you is fake and it's not real. If you find yourself getting anxiety or jealousy on social media, delete your account right then and there. 
Why would you subject yourself to these things? If you are so fantasizing about this life that you wish to live, stop watching shows about million-dollar listings. You have to not subject yourself to the desires of the world and the temptation because they're singing a song like a Pied Piper to allure you out of the life you're called to live. They're alluring you out of this life that we are all called to live. Now, Paul then breaks down temptation. I believe probably the most brilliant chapter on temptation is 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Again, famous verse, a lot of us know, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you that's not common to men. God is faithful, and he will let you not be tempted beyond your ability. With temptation, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Now, I'm going to bring up one of these major aspects of temptation. Uh, A great leader that we often bring out named Mike Brain has coined this as the temptation of appetite. So we all have these appetites within us, and that's how the enemy allures us. In Matthew chapter 4, it says that Jesus is hungry. He comes when there's dissatisfaction in your life or there's a natural human need. So many of us will quote this passage and we'll pray that God provides this way of escape like a magic wand, but he's not talking about walking down the red light district of Amsterdam saying, really, I hope that I'm not allured into one of these prostitutional houses. See, we can't put ourselves in an environment like, okay, God, if you really don't want me to watch pornography, just let my computer shut down. That's not how it works. See, it says he provides a way of escape, but we often miss the setup to this amazing verse. He breaks down the temptation of Israel in the wilderness. Verses 1 through 12 are all about Israel failing as they were tempted in the wilderness. 1 through 4 lists these incredible miracles that they see. But verse 5, Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. It's a brutal verse. Overthrown. They were overpowered. They were overcome. They were put into slavery yet again by this sinful temptation. Now, how were they tempted? It goes on to say this, verse 6. Now, these things look, took place as examples for us that we might not desire evil as they did. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it is written. The people sat down to eat, drink, and play and rose up. We must not indulge in sexual immorality as for some of them did, and 23,000 fell in a single day. As you read this, there's three main temptations that Paul starts to break down that I believe the enemy uses. Number one is idolatry. Number two is uh, sexual immorality. Number three is testing God. Testing God. Now, that's one we're going to break down more next week because it's a little bit more of a concept, or a complex concept to tie our, our, our minds around. But really, these first two here, idolatry and sexual immorality, we can see where sexual immorality is pervasive in our culture, but idolatry is something that we all are subject to. We just deny it. I remember reading 1 John. At the very end of 1 John, he says, Now, little children, keep yourselves from idols. I thought to myself, Idols? What idols are in my life? What an outdated verse. We just don't have the context. Idols can look like this. Idols are things that we put above our relationship with God. Your idols, your workplace, your idol can be your home. Where its look and its presentation is so important, you've created your own mini temple to materialism. Your idol can be your work schedule. It can be your little life. We have to be aware to what are the idols in our life? What are those things that we lift up in the place of God? But the one that he really draws attention to, which I believe is the most pervasive in culture, is sexual immorality. Now, when you break down this word, the very basis of this word, this Greek word, is this. The word porne, where we get the word pornography. That's what sexual immorality is. It's porn. Now, it goes beyond this. We've classified pornography as this one little thing that we see on our screen. But it's any type of sexual sin. That's what Paul's talking about. 
And there's this temptation and allurement that happens. Now, Paul ties this in to wilderness and the Israelites, but you have to understand, he's speaking to a Gentile audience, people that are like us in Corinth. I believe there are two churches that really mirror the modern-day American church. Number one is the Church of Laodicea in Revelation, the church that kind of fell asleep in the middle of it and have become lukewarm. But I believe the church that mirrors the modern charismatic church or the non-denominational Pentecostal church is the Church of Corinth. Because guess what? They had revival meetings every night. They had a killer worship team. They had a lot of miracles happening. But there was perversion inside the church. They let that sleeping giant of sexual morality in. So much so, they weren't able to confront it that leaders on their team were sleeping with their father's other wives. I mean, really difficult stuff. But Paul calls it out. He has this weird little thing he says. It's a quote from Exodus. We have to understand that not many would have understood Exodus. And he says this, Behold, they sat down, ate, drank, and rose up to play. Paul, in his brilliance, quotes Exodus, but ties it in to a modern toast in the Greco-Roman culture that was this. O ruler of all fine deeds, grant me a long age of drinking, fun, and giving thought to what is just. They would say this as they would toast to Dionysus and Zeus was the song of the culture. You would stand up, and here's what's so intriguing about it. A ruler of all that is fine and good. Let me have a long life of drinking and fun and giving thought to what is just. See, there was this separation of actions and mindset. And a lot of us are subject to this in the church. We have biblical thinking and worldly living. We have biblical mindset with limited action. See, we've done this thing, and Brian broke this down beautifully. When Jesus' kingdom comes in, he says, repent and believe for the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? Remember this, this verse we've talked about? Repentance is this change of mindset, metanoia, this change of thinking, while belief is the change of action. We have subjected belief as strictly our mindset, not our life. And here's how the Christian life works. We have this knowledge leg and this action leg. And we grow in knowledge and actions called to follow from what we learn. So when I, when I learn something new, I step forward in knowledge. I then am followed by the behavioral action that takes place. That's the context of belief. They would say you're crazy. Or as James says, faith without works is dead. It didn't make sense to them because belief always had to do with your behavior. That's what they believed. But many of us, and if you feel stuck in your Christian life, I believe this is often the symptom. We grow in knowledge. We grow in knowledge. We grow in knowledge, and we say, I'm not growing anymore. I'm dissatisfied. God's not meeting my needs. He says, move your leg. Get into action. Do something with what I've taught you. Will you put to test the words that I've given you and the works that are meant to follow? Will you trust me? And Satan comes in and says, if you're the son of God, why don't you make these stones bread? Now, what we have to capture is this. This is not a temptation of moral compromise. It's a temptation of trust. It's the trust of provision. There was this weird little belief in the Jewish Talmud that when the Messiah came, he would recreate the miracle of manna. They all knew this was the qualification of the Messiah. Not biblical, but cultural. So here Satan comes in and says, if you're God's son, identity, why don't you make this happen? See, the enemy knows exactly how to lure us. And Jesus is hungry, but Jesus would remember that although he had the power to do the miracle, it may not have been God's will. Moses struck a rock with a staff and water came out. 
Israel grumbles and complains again, God says, speak to the rock. Moses strikes it with a staff. He can't go to the promised land. See, the enemy knows what can disqualify us. He's trying his best to not let you enter the promises after the wilderness. But guess what? Where we're weak, Jesus is strong. Where we fail, Jesus is faithful. As the writer of Hebrews says, he was tempted in every way in which we are, yet without sin. No matter what that temptation coming your way is, will you trust him in your wilderness? And Jesus' reply in its brilliance, man will not live by bread alone, but every word that comes out of the mouth of God. He quotes right out of Deuteronomy. Chapter 8 says this. He humbled you by letting you hunger, then by feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors were acquainted, in order to make you understand that one does not live by bread alone. See, Jesus quotes from this passage, and he ties it in. It says, I know the hunger that I've encountered is for my humility. See, the hunger that you've encountered is for your humility, that you can look like Jesus. That you can lower your life, get down to the ground, embrace this quality called humility that honestly our culture has adopted because of Christianity, but back then would have been an insane, insane proclamation. Humility was for the peasants. Humility was for the poor. Humility was for those you never wanted to look like. And Jesus humbled himself, becoming a servant, even death on the cross. This is the invitation we have. And Jesus says, will you eat that bread of life? And see, he uses the word here for manna. Here's what you have to understand. We think of this miracle of manna as the most amazing euphoric experience. If God was making manna out of the sky, we have to understand this. They were used to eating bread. Anybody have grandmothers that made bread, like fresh bread? Like that was the most incredible thing you'd ever smell. Like you walk in, you're like, oh my goodness. This is like literally what heaven probably smells like. Bread. <laughs> All those gluten-free are like, preach. <laughs> one day, one day we'll eat it again, I promise you. <laughs> but manna literally means, what is it? <laughs> let me just let you into a secret of the Lord. The provision he brings is not often not the provision you want. The provision he brings is not the provision you want, but it's necessary. They want bread. He gives them manna to sustain them. It's actually better for them. Lower carb count, you know. <laughs> Will you say yes to that provision? Will you embrace that test of provision? Or will you give into the temptation of appetite? Just as we close this morning, I'm about my good friends, Natalie and Carrie, just to share their story. Would you welcome Natalie and Carrie? Come on. We've been together for 16 years, married almost 14. And in those years, we've been through numerous struggles from loss of jobs, injuries and hospitalizations to struggles with our oldest child. But the biggest struggle we have ever gone through is a struggle for control with God. Out of the 14 years we've been married, 13 of those as Christ followers, only four of those years have not been plagued with financial struggle. In 2012, I took a job that I thought was going to be life-changing, leading us to financial freedom. Making a six-figure salary was a dream come true. Night work, lasting 70 hours plus. A week, um, sacrifice. It was a sacrifice I was willing to make. As the years went on, I was not seeing the freedom that I wanted to see. We were still living paycheck to paycheck, often not tithing in fear that we wouldn't have money to pay our bills. 
In this time, I was really struggling with trusting God's word. I would pray Joshua 9 or Joshua 1 9 over myself at night in hoping for breakthrough. It says, I have not, or have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged, for the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Little did I know, all I had to do was open my hands and let go. While Carrie was working long nights, God was doing work in me. I could see the struggle my husband was going through and would try to strong arm him into tithing, saying, don't worry about the money. God's going to take care of us. This backfired as his fear and need to provide were stronger than his belief. With our family falling apart due to lack of time together and Carrie's health deteriorating, I knew something needed to change. With lack of sleep, the financial struggle, a family in unrest, my nerves were shot and I was taking it out on everyone around me. The enemy was using my weakness and I knew I needed to take back what I had given and stop believing the lies. This began our journey of allowing God to truly provide. After much prayer and discussion, Carrie took a job as a refuse truck driver, a garbage man, making 65% less than his truck driving job. We knew a lot of things would have to change in order to make it work. Letting go of everything that wasn't essential, including an expensive car payment, was our first step. Trusting that God would make our money stretch, we utilized the food pantry on Thursdays and said no to all extras. Although I could see God being faithful, I was still struggling to fully submit financially. As I was waiting for a permanent position to open up for me as a garbage man, I re-injured my shoulder, causing me to live in a constant state of pain. I was questioning my choices as I fought depression silently, regretting my job change. I'd gained a lot of time that I spent with my family, which was amazing. Our home life was stable. My relationship with my wife was better than ever. ever. But we were still living paycheck to paycheck, not knowing where all the money was going to be for, for where it was coming from for our bills. And I still feared not being able to provide for my family. 11 months after Carrie started his new job, I got a phone call from him in the middle of the day. He called to tell me he had been let go and no longer had a job. In the past, I would have freaked out. I would have gone into panic attacks and just like figure it out mode. But that's because I crave stability. <laughs> and for the last 11 months since he lost his, or since he took this job, I had already been kind of just holding on barely. Um, I braced myself for the onslaught of emotions, but what came over me was God's peace. I knew things were about to get much, much harder, but I also knew in my spirit that things were also about to get really good. This is where it went. <laughs> we went from six figures to 65% less, bringing in to $1,000 a month in less than a year, or within a year. As I stood in the kitchen holding my wife, I heard God say, it's time to let go. At that point, I knew that I needed to fully give myself financially and all to him. We had nothing but God's promise to, to, prov to provide. Matthew 7, 24, 25, which states, therefore, Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the storms rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fail because of his foundation on the rock. I knew in my head what we needed to do all along, but it was, <laughs> I knew what we needed to do all along. Oh, man. So I couldn't ignore it anymore. I made the commitment from that port, part, point excuse me, to give my first fruits financially and otherwise to God who is faithful to us. And this is where it got a little crazy. Our mortgage company reduced our mortgage by two-thirds through a forbearance program. So we went from $1,200 a month to $400. We were given a car. 
after ours died. Random bags of groceries, cash, gift cards were all left anonymously on our front porches. <laughs> our children's extracurriculars were sponsored and bills were paid, all without us asking. God took care of it all. We tithed, we gave freely, and we still had money in the bank. <laughs> $1,000 a month, that's all we were making. And it was miraculous. I've never felt more loved or seen, and all of our, gods, or all of our needs were taken care of by God and the generosity of our community. But God was, doesn't just care about our needs. He relishes in being able to fulfill our wants as well. So, yeah. So, right before I had um, been let go from my job, we were planning our anniversary trip to Disneyland. So, the hotel was already paid for. We were planning on using my paycheck right before we were going to buy our tickets to Disneyland. And, obviously, that didn't happen because <laughs> three weeks before we were supposed to go, I was let go. So... Uh, after much urging from our family and friends, everybody just was like, you need to go anyways, make it a beach trip, get away, reestablish. So we're like, okay, all right, we'll go. As we get to the hotel, we walk in, it's full of Disney decor everywhere. So we're like smacked in the face. Checking into the counter, the lady is amazing. She's like, oh, will you be staying at, you know, as your stay here, are you guys going to go to Disneyland? We're like, yeah, no. So we told her a brief version of our story of what happened, that we were just going to make it a beach trip, see some sights, and she assured us we'd have fun anyways. About two hours later, we're getting ready to go to dinner. We're leaving the hotel, and I receive a call from the hotel. And the lady on the phone says, it's the manager. She said that there's a problem with our reservation. Can you please come back to the front desk? Here we are freaking out after everything that, you know, has been stripped from us. We're like, okay, well, you ready to make the long drive home? <laughs> We walk in to the um, lobby, and there is a bunch of staff members holding balloons, and they hand us a card with two Disneyland tickets in it. So God does get your wants. Our trip was magical, obviously, and the whole way through the park, I just kept saying, I can't believe we're here. It was just like the biggest blessing to be able to celebrate God's goodness with my husband in our favorite place. The past several months, have been, uh, we have been faithful in doing what God has asked us to do. We have Proverbs 28.20 hanging in our kitchen as a reminder of the journey we have been through, and it says, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hurries to be rich will not go unpunished. Going from having so much with nothing to show for it to having nothing but God's love, grace, and provision has proven that all you really need is just that, God. We know there will always be trials. And there will always be hard times. But where are we putting our trust? We know what works and what doesn't. And I pray that we always be intentional with allowing God to do work in our lives and not the other way around. Thank you. So doing it my way in the beginning, making six figures, obviously was not the plan. Um, now, after everything has crashed down and God has slapped me and woke me up into walking his path, uh, recently I was offered a job with the potential to make six figures again, and I know that we will get there again. So I could see it. It's his way this time, not mine. So thank you all for letting us share, you guys. Let's stand together. We're going to pray. To invite down. Let's just stay standing. Let's invite the prayer team down. We're just going to have a minute here to pray so the prayer team can come forward. Father, we just thank you for this amazing morning. As we know, many of us are in the middle of this test, the test of provision. Will we trust you? No matter what our economic status is, there's always a test. There's always an opportunity. There's always a furthering of your kingdom that you want us to be a part of. God, we know it would be easier for you to do kingdom work without us. Yet, you invite us into it. Lord, we thank you that we're your children, that you love us. God, right now, we just open up our hearts to say, what are you speaking? Right now, if you're in that place where you're in the test of provision, 
And you're saying and hearing that invitation for God inviting you to trust him. Just raise your hand right now if that's you. Father, we just believe that we can trust. We will trust. We will trust. We will hold firm. We will stand faithful. God, we pray for those that are in the middle of temptation, that right now they would not surrender to that sin of appetite. Lord, they would be fed off the word of God, off your words that come from your mouth and straight to their hearts. Speak to them now. Father, I just ask that you just soften everybody's hearts today in this room, Lord, that needs you, God. I ask that you help humble them, Lord, to come forward, God, to step out of the darkness and into the light of you, God. Lord, give everybody the encouragement to stand strong in you, Lord, and say yes to you today, God, like I did. Stop living in fear. God is here and God is waiting for you. God loves you. Thank you. Lord, we just thank you so much for um, gently guiding us, sometimes not so gently, but um, that you're always there for us, even as we're trying to work it out ourselves, that you never strong arm us like we try to strong strong arm each other, but that you just are there and you're waiting for us to get it. And so I just pray today that as people are walking through whatever it is that they're struggling with, whatever wilderness they're walking through, that they would just really understand what surrender means. And that they would just say, Lord, I give it to you. What I've been carrying on my shoulders, I now take off of my shoulders and lay at your feet. And that the Lord would just fill you with his presence and his peace and his and just the understanding that you are not alone. You are never alone. We thank you, God, for your love and your provision. In Jesus' name.